We're into the series of Prophets and Kings, and we're almost over. Uh, we have one more uh, study besides this one. Uh, this is the second to last one. Uh, we will look at the last king of uh, Judah, southern kingdom of Judah, and it's from Second Chronicles chapter 36, verses 11 to 21. Let's read responsively as we uh, usually do. This is verse 11. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. He stiff stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Therefore he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young men or virgin, old man or aged. He gave them all into his hand. And they burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious vessels. together to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. This is the word of God. I want to share with you a childhood story, uh, actually a very sad story. Uh, I remember maybe I was like five or six years old, and uh, there was something that I really wanted so badly. I, I was living in Korea in Daejeon uh, back in the 80s. And uh, you kind of guess my age, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the one thing I really badly wanted was, were rain boots, right? No toy, no snack, rain boots. And it was a special rain boots because it was one of those, you know, uh, with a character logo on it. And uh, if you grew up in Korea, you probably know Doksuri <laughs> Ohyongje, the five eagle brothers, if you translate literally, uh, boots. I mean, every kid wanted that. Do you know Doksuri oh, Ohyongje? You do? Wow. <laughs> How old are you? <laughs> ages ago. And, uh, you know, uh, no mom can you know, win over their sons, you know, nagging. And so she bought me the boots, and it was like, uh, like $10 back then, Imanon in Korean. So it was, you know, price was pretty high, steep for our economy, and uh, we weren't doing very well, kind of economically speaking, and uh, so it was a really, uh, you know, a big expenditure. Anyway, so I was so grateful, and uh, what do you do with boots? You gotta go out, you gotta trample upon the earth and you know, conquer the mud piles and the fields. Back then, you know, there were so many unpaved roads in Korea, so many unpaved just field. And so I wanted to conquer that field over there after, they, after it rained all day yesterday. So with my mighty boots on, I walked into the mud pile, the field. And um, I was enjoying myself, you know, I'm invincible, I, I can do this, right? But as I was getting closer and closer to the center of the field, I realized my, my feet are getting heavier, and it's harder to, to um, move myself, and I'm um, sinking deeply into the, the mud. 
and uh, for a five, six year old kid, it was almost impossible to move at all. So I could not go back. I could not go forward. I was just stuck right in the middle of the mud field. What would a five year old do if you're stuck in a mud field with boots on, brand new boots on? The only thing you can do is cry, right? So I was crying all the way back to home, leaving my boots in the mud. And that was the most, you know, sorry day of my five, uh, fifth, uh, you know, when I was five years old. And this happened twice, in fact. And so I never dared to ask to uh, my mom to buy me boots anymore. And to this day, I'm not wearing boots, even to this day, because of that embarrassing episode. Even though we're adults, um, we sometimes get the feeling that we are walking in a mud field with our boots on. We're, we have the boots, spiritual boots of faith. We're supposed to be able to conquer sin, to trample on the temptation of this world and live a victorious life in the Lord every day, to roam anywhere in the world and still come out strong in the Lord with, because we have the faith, boots of faith. But uh, the reality is sometimes we are stuck heavy, deep in, in the busyness of life, of the world, the worries, concerns, and we feel like we cannot move. Uh, you know, not talking about just, just, you know, going somewhere, just surviving itself is even difficult. And I see people time to time leaving their booths of faith in the world and being shipwrecked in their faith, and they leave God entirely. It's a very sad situation. Whether we you know, go to that, that count, we hopefully we won't get that in that situation, but whoever we might be, if we stay in that mud pile, that mud field too long, none of us can survive. We will be all burnt out. We'll lose our faith. And we find ourselves sometimes in the middle of that world crying to God. Are you still there? Do you still care? I thought I had my boots on. I, was, I thought I was invincible, but I am not. Um, what happened? You know, our faith that was once strong and we were faithful to the Lord. And when we sing this morning, you know, how great he is, the things he has done, we feel like we are children of God. We can do some things for God. But in real life, uh, we are not that great. And we are burnt out spiritually. Once our, our spirituality with God was so, so burning, was the love for God was so hot. But sometimes it grows cold like ice. And we begin to experience the downfall of our spiritual faith. Um, this spiritual downfall is not something that happens overnight, right? It happens gradually. And the Bible this morning talks about that gradual downfall of a person's faith, of a nation, nation's faith, in fact. As we understand the steps, st steps of the downfall of our spiritual status, we can find the answer to not be in that dangerous situation, not walk those steps down the spiritual downward path. What are the steps, steps to spiritual uh, downfall? That's the uh, question we want to ask and answer this morning from the last king and the last um, episode of the kingdom of southern Judah. The first step is this. A first step of spiritual downfall is a hardened heart. We find this in the story of the king. Uh, Zedekiah. Zedekiah was the last king of southern Judah. We know now, but back then, he, did not, he wasn't sure. He didn't know he was going to be the last king. And he lived back in B.C. 597 to 586. He reigned for 11 years. And uh, Zedekiah might not be so famous, but there is a famous king. And that was his father, Josiah. He was the a king who brought revival, spiritual renewal in the kingdom of Judah and the last part of kingdom of the nation's, uh, nation's life. And uh, as a boy, as the youngest son of, of Josiah, Zedekiah might have remembered the glory days, how God restored his nation, the worship was restored. There was this book of Moses found in the temple and the temple was cleansed and people's hearts were cleansed and were repent repentant worship services all over for many months. May Zedekiah as a child remember those days. He also remembers when his dad, uh, Josiah, he died and for the past uh, 10 years uh, after his father's death, 
He's seeing the downward spiral of his nation as his brothers became king. They successfully became, they reigned as king, and they were attacked by Babylon, and this was a result of the nation's disobedience to God and spiritual idolatry. And in fact, the, the, the city of Israel, Jerusalem, had been, uh, was uh, surrounded for two years, and it was, in fact, um, destroyed. Uh, first and then second time already, and many people were, were uh, taken captive to Babylon. And Zedekiah was a king at this time. And many uh, warning signs were given to Zedekiah about the downward spiral, the spiritual downwardness of the nation, and Zedekiah would, should have known better. But we can see from Zedekiah's life and his heart what were the steps of the eventual ruin of his spiritual state and also the state of his nation. In verses 11, verses 11 and 12, we find Zedekiah's acts and his heart, what, uh, where he was. In verse 11, let's go back there. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became to reign as reign king, and he eventually reigned 11 years. 12, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. What kind of evil did he commit? He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who had made him swear by God. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. He was the victor, victorious king that conquered Jerusalem. And uh, through God, God used Nebuchadnezzar to judge uh, southern Judah. And they were to submit to him in order to survive. And Nebuchadnezzar reminded um, uh, Zedekiah of this fact that God, I am a vessel of God and you should commit, submit to us. But Zedekiah, he didn't. He abandoned this allegiance. He was not humble and he was evil in the eyes of God. What made Zedekiah's heart commit such evil and such arrogance in his life. In verse 12, we find that he w indeed was not um, humble in any way, and uh, he uh, rebelled, right? The first step of spiritual downfall is the hardened heart of people of God. Uh, verse 12. Verse 13 says, He rebelled against the king, about against king Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord. What does it mean that he stiffened his neck? What does that mean? Well, in the, uh, in the origin, the origin of the expression is from a uh, farming. It's a, uh, you know, cattle uh, image, right? In the old days, you would plow the field with a, a cow or ox, right, rather. And uh, nowadays, you have machinery. You can, you can plow straight and be very effective, efficient with your land. But back then, the, the cow driver, the ox driver, had to plow and, and lead the ox in a straight path, as, as straight as possible. Sometimes the ox would stray away to the left or right. And uh, the driver, the farmer, would use a ox gourd, right? This rod to, to hit, to strike at the neck so it'll make adjustment and walk, continue to walk on straight. But some ox are very stubborn. They have the, a mind of their own, right? And, you know, you hit it, you strike it, but it, it deliberately disobeys. It is stiff-necked, even though it's, uh, it's uh, stimulated on the neck, it doesn't respond. And that's the condition that Zedekiah was in. God has stimulated him through, through many trials and discipline by the, of the nations, especially through the Babylon. But there was no response from Zedekiah. His heart was hardened. His neck was stiffened. He was arrogant. This was the first symptom of the downfall of a person of God. He or she has a stone heart, stone cold heart does that cannot and does not respond to the, uh, the work of God in their life. So what was the result of this kind of stiff-necked and hard-hearted heart? Um, we see that uh, the king Zedekiah, he lived as he wished. 
he threw away the yoke of Babylon, and he also, just like, just like Zedekiah, his officers, his, his uh, priests, also offered sacrifice to God, in, not to God, but to idols in the sanctuary of God. The holy place that was used solely for worshiping the uh, God of the universe. They start to uh, idol, uh, offer a sacrifice to idols and all these um, dis despicable things. Uh, adulterous things, spiritual adultery was happening in the land and there was no way to stop uh, the will, or the sinful desire of his people. The ox must walk straight. It has a path that it needs to walk. But when it is stiff-necked, it's hardened in heart, there's no way to control this ox. And at the end, the uh, city of Jerusalem would fall. Despite all these things, Zedekiah continued on his path. You know, those who have hardened hearts, we call them spiritually dead people because they cannot, they do not respond. Those people do not have hope because they are virtually dead. Uh, St. Augustine, do you pronounce his name Augustine or Augustine? You know, it depends on where you're from. If you're from the south, you call him Augustine. If you're from the northeast, say August Augustine, <laughs> right? Anyway, uh, St. Augustine or Augustine, uh, he uh, talks about faith. He talks about faith and he says, faith has two daughters. If you have faith, you have two daughters. This is what he says. Hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not re remain the way they are. So you see how you are not happy with the status quo. You're not happy with the sinful situation in your life or in society. And you want to do something about it. You stand up, you make a protest, and you take action. You try to restore what's wrong, make it right. And that's, those are the two daughters. The outrage and the courage are the daughters of hope. That's what Augustine said. If we look at Zedekiah's love, he had no hope. He had no holy indignation against the sinfulness of the nation. He had no courage. He had no empowerment to make any change in this down, downward spiral in, his spiritual, in the spiritual condition of his country, his nation. In fact, he was hopeless because he was spiritually dead and that was due to his hardening of his heart. What are our hearts like this morning? You, your heart and my heart this morning. I believe the Bible is not here just to remind us of what happened in history. It's not a history book. It's more than a history book. It is written and recorded and preserved for us so that it could be a mirror, a reflect, reflection of who God is in our lives. How is our heart? How is your heart? Are we indignant when we see unholiness and sinfulness in our lives? Are we angry, upset at the injustice and the uh, compassionlessness of our lives when that happens. Do we do something about, do we make daily decisions and commitments to do something about uh, unholiness in our lives? Or do we rather say, that's just who I am. I can't change anything. And we secretly live in a, a spiritual, um, spiritual laziness. Are we just dead spiritually? Are we hard, hard in our hearts. If we have no desire to fight against the sins in our lives, if we, if we, if our, you and I, our, our lives would be exactly the same as the world, we might be spiritually dead. We might be stone cold hearted and cannot respond to what God is doing in our lives, what he is trying to say to us. We must always reflect upon our hearts so that our hearts will not be hardened before the Lord. When he disciplines us, when he speaks to us, as we saw in many of the prophets, many, a couple of weeks through, uh, you know, Joel, we saw through Jonah and Hosea, and we see things happen in our lives, how God, because he loves us, he disciplines his sons and daughters, and if we are not responding to, to those stimuli, we might be, have the symptom, we might have the symptom of, of spiritual hard-heartedness. 
and we cannot respond to the work of God. This was the first stage of spiritual downwardness. And there's a second. The second is more aggressive against God. The second step of spiritual downfall is the, desi- the despising of God's word. It is a despisement of God's word. We find in verse 15 and 16 that Zedekiah became so stiff-necked and hardened in his heart that God started to speak to him. He didn't understand what God was doing, that God was sending a message. Now he spoke to him through his prophets. In verse 15, it says that God had pity on them. The Lord God of their father sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. God loved his people. God loved Zedekiah. God um, wanted to spare them. So look at this very carefully, how, what he did. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently. He diligently, again and again, continuously, repeatedly, persistently, sent them his messengers. He sent them his word so they can hear what God's plans were, what God, how God was seeing them, diagnose them spiritually of their sins. God wanted them to repent. If, uh, you know, you were God, maybe you were thinking, maybe God was thinking like this. Uh, he had seen through the many centuries in the nation of Judah how he had sent the prophets and there was repentance. Maybe he will remember freshly, God remember freshly the Josiah story. How, you know, people's heart were broken and, and they truly fasted and the whole nation, they turned to God. Even the story of Jonah is still fresh, fresh to us. God remembers how he sent Jonah to the enemy nation of Nineveh because he loved 120,000 people there. And when Jonah proclaimed the message, after 40 days, you will be punished. This city, great city will fall. They repented. From the king, even to the animal, they put on sackcloth and ashes and they asked God for forgiveness. And there was great revival and repentance in that city, great city. And just the same, God has compassion and pity upon his very own people of Judah. So he could not, he did not spare his prophets. He did not spare his words to tell them what's going on, to tell them that judgment is coming and they should repent immediately. Maybe that's what God expected, for them to have a turnaround, for the people of God to turn around and repent before God because he loved them so much. So did they repent in these last stages of the nation of Judah? Look within verse 16. What did happen? But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of God rose against his people until there was no remedy. There was no cure for this people. Although God persistently and diligently deliver his message to his people, through Jeremiah especially, what did the people of God do? They were not just unresponding, non-responding to God's message, but they despised God's messengers, God's message, and they despised God. This is the second stage of spiritual downwardness as a people of God. Zedekiah, he, knew, he heard the message of God from Jeremiah through the years. That if, we, if you repent, Zedekiah, I mean, I'm sorry, if you, uh, you know, surrender to, to the Babylonians, God will spare your life. At least your life will be spared. And God's will will be done for this nation of Judah as we, as we submit to this, uh, uh, this tremendous power, foreign power. And what did Zedekiah do? Uh, I want to deviate a little bit into the story of uh, Jeremiah. Actually, Jeremiah was the prophet that spoke these words to Zedekiah. In Jeremiah chapter 38, verses 14 to 18. Can you show us that, Brother Faisal? Do we have those verses? Uh, Jeremiah. I'll just read the uh, first verse. 
Uh, let's read together, in fact, 14. Ready, go. King Zedekiah sent for Jeremiah the prophet and received him at the third entrance of the temple of the Lord. The king said to Jeremiah, I will ask you a question. Hide nothing from me. Zedekiah, King Zedekiah had heard Jeremiah's message before. Maybe Zedekiah, uh, Jeremiah had been preaching, like it says, uh, entrance of the temple. He was preaching to the people, repent, we need to surrender to God's will and to God's judgment, Babylon. And, uh, you know, Zedekiah heard this, and he took it very seriously, in fact. Zedekiah did, was not a person that despised God, right? And he, in fact, respected the word of God from Jeremiah, who has been around for a long time, in fact, from his father's days. And so he had a one-on-one -on -one interview with uh, Jeremiah, Look at what it says. I will ask you a question. Hide nothing from me. Whether it's good or bad, I want to hear everything that God has to say to me. He was very serious about the word of God. He was very serious about the will of God for him and for his nation. And so after, you know, Jeremiah tells him that, again, you know, same thing that you need to surrender to Babylon, at least your life will be spared and God's will will be done, what do you think Zedekiah would have done? We find in the latter verses that Zedekiah, he told Jeremiah not to say this to anybody else. And he promised them safety. I will keep you safe. And uh, what did he do? He locked him up and uh, he kept Jeremiah to the very end as a maybe an insurance policy so that this thing does not happen you know he wanted to make sure that he they would not be surrendering to Babylon he applied it the other way the opposite way of what God told him how could this be Zedekiah did not despise the Word of God literally he did not like you know rip the Bible and persecute the prophet of God he honored and respected. He wanted to hear. He wanted to go deeper into Bible study, so to speak. He wanted to understand the will of God for his life and for his nation. It was not that he despised the word of God or the messenger of God. But he did despise the word of God in the respect that he did not believe in the word of God. He thought he could change what God had said. In fact, he despised the will of God. And so this leads to a, uh, a, 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 a turning point that is unrecoverable. In verses 17 to 21, the third step of the spiritual downfall, down, uh, downfall is the judgment of God. At the end, Zedekiah and the people of Judah were allowed to be ruined, to be conquered. The wrath of God uh, was there, and it was irrecoverable. You know, we learn from, from David's Psalms many times that God's uh, goodness and his mercies are ever, uh, everlasting. It doesn't end. But we also have, need to remember that there is an end to God's patience. As we are outside the cycle of sinning, repentance, and restoration, if we get out from the circle, God's grace and mercy is no longer there. That's what, in fact, what happened to the nation of Judah. When God, he, he retracted his hand of grace, of his mercy, the, the, the city fell immediately. And we know that uh, many people were destroyed by the sword, by the enemy of Babylon. And the, the temple was burnt. And the city was burnt. Can you show us a picture? And many people were taken as captives into the city of, of Babylon for 70 years. The story ends in 21 saying that for, uh, for 70 years, just like Jeremiah said, the, the land enjoyed Sabbath rest. This uh, you know, spiritual interpretation here. And the land rested for 70 years, 70 years, just like God had promised to Jeremiah. We must remember that although God is a God of goodness and mercy and of love and of forgiveness, but he is also a God of righteousness. And there is a day of judgment. There is a day of wrath. There is a day of the Lord, and he will keep his promise. You might think this word was for back in Jeremiah's day, back in Zedekiah's day, but for us to, for us to have a clear understanding of that, the, the same principle applies today. Uh, 
Peter, who is uh, Jesus' disciple, says the same thing. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 to 9. In fact, let's read these verses together on the screen. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wish that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The Apostle Paul, I mean, so Peter, wants to remind us that the day of the Lord is coming. It is not behind us, it is ahead of us. You might think, oh, it's been 2,000 years, Pastor Joseph, since Jesus ascended into heaven, and things have gotten better in society. There has never been so much progress in society, so much medical breakthrough and technological advancement, and the world is coming together. It's so much easier and safer to travel anywhere in the world within a day or two, and uh, we have communication information in the palm of our hands. And there's democracy, there's advancement, uh, civilization is advancing. What are you talking about, judgment? But I want to, you know, uh, uh, put, uh, you know, um, have your attention on this verse again. It says, uh, for the Lord, 1,000 years is how many days? It says one day. It has been 2,000 years since our Lord Jesus ascended. How many days has it been for God? since then. It's only been three days ago since Jesus ascended. And Peter explains to us the only reason that God is waiting, he's persistent on sending his messengers even today, is that we would have a chance. More of his people have a a chance to repent and trust in the name of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It is only because the grace of God, the goodness of God, that he is still waiting. We must not forget that the day of the Lord is coming, and God will deliver his promise. So how shall we live, brothers and sisters, as a result of this passage that we're reading this morning? The the application is rather simple to avoid us going this downward path spiritually, Um, We need to have the soft heart of obeying God's word daily. Before we even get to the hard-heartedness, before we get there of despising the word of God unintentionally or intentionally, we can go in another path and we can obey God's word freshly each day. You know, last Sunday, I probably didn't mention it here this, during this worship service, but I gave an application. I suggested that uh, as we, after we heard the story of Jeremiah and how he has given a mission to introduce people to God, right? That is our mission. All of us have the mission to introduce God to someone. That's the thought and light mission to us. I uh, suggested since Thanksgiving Sunday is coming up next week, um, why don't we invite somebody that is not in God to help them to worship the Lord and give him the credit for all the wonderful things that has happened to them this year. And so, uh, you know, over the Wednesday evening, uh, we have Bible study, a couple of us have Bible study, and we prayed over that. We wrote down some names of people that we want to invite for Thanksgiving Sunday, and we prayed. We lifted up our hearts to God in obedience to uh, the work, the mission that God has given to us. Small, rather small thing, but it is a important thing that we need to daily. In fact, we are emphasizing daily quiet time this season. What is daily quiet time? It is a time when we read and meditate on the Word of God and we obey God's Word. We all have that respect for the Word of God. You respect, have the respect for the people of God, so you read the Word and you hear even this message. But despite the fact that we honor God's word, we can effectively live as people, as people who despise the word of God because of our non or disobedience. You know, I've mentioned uh, Howard Hendricks, my uh, spiritual mentor and uh, friend who is with the Lord right now. I remember he saying in class, a couple of times in fact, 
You know, uh, if you know anything about Howard Hendricks, he's the master teacher of inductive Bible study methods. And uh, if you study inductive Bible methods, Bible method, uh, it's about you know observation, interpretation, and application. And this is what he says. Actually, just go to the slide. Actually, it says observation plus interpretation minus application is spiritual abortion. We can read our Bibles, we can do worship services and hear God's voice and enjoy his presence all day long, all throughout the year. But if there is no application, if there is no action, if there is no repentance, turning our ways, changing our ways in line with the word of God, he says it's spiritual abortion. There is no result. The purpose of the Bible is for life change, not for information. We study the Bible, we teach the Bible, we preach it, and we interpret it so that we can have changed lives. But looking at our lives more closely, my life and your life, we don't see that application as much as we absorb the Word of God in our lives, in our heads. For us not to have this hard, closed heart, for us not to have this closed Bible, the one remedy that I pray we all have this morning is that let us have that soft heart of obedience to God, of even that one word of God, because that becomes a reminder for our day, for the week, to remember what God's will for us is. It could be, you know, after you've read your word, after you've done your Bible study, it could be, God could be saying, saying, do your mission by sending a text to somebody, inviting them. It could be so much as saying a small prayer for somebody that is lost. Whatever it might be, as we live out each day in obedience, whether small, whether big, we will not fall into this downward, downward spiral of spiritual shipwreckness, but we'll live a a path, a straight path of obedience, a path that leads to life, a path that leads to spiritual abundance so that we will not go into that mud pile and get our spiritual boots muddy and find ourselves crying in the field. Let us put on the boots of faith and walk in obedience each day with a soft heart listening to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray.